Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to be looking at Red Hat Enterprise Linux version 8.4, right after this. So on, uh, I think it was uh, May the 19th, Red Hat released version 8.4. And of course, it had been out in a, or an early access view of the system prior to that. And I want to talk a little bit about some of the features of Red Hat 8.4 and then talk about some of the ways to install or upgrade it today. So Red Hat versions... The in within the major release that is going from 8.0, 8.1, 8.2, those generally are released about every six months or so. There's no guarantee though that Red Hat will maintain that particular pace, but that is typically what they do now. Red Hat is a long term release, meaning that it is supported for an, a 10 year period, but. Let's break it down. So the full support for Red Hat Enterprise Linux is 5.5 years. Then they do maintenance support, what they call maintenance support two for an additional 3.5. And those are mostly security enhancements to make sure that the system is, is not vulnerable to anything that might crop up during that period. But generally, Unless there is some extenuating reason, they generally don't enhance the releases. So if you stayed on 8.4 for 10 years, the first 5.5, you would see updates and, and, and that sort of thing. But then at the 3.5 year, uh, in, in incremental uh, beyond the 5.5 years, you would start to see uh, just security enhancements being done. You can, you can purchase extended life phases if you wish. Those are negotiated add-ons, and that depends on what your needs are for your particular business on how long you would need additional support in order to play that out. And that does happen. I mean, it does happen in, in situations where you have strict security requirements or particular compliance uh, requirements that you have to meet that require long-time or long-term certification uh, windows in order to accomplish those. So, yeah, I mean, that's very common, particularly in healthcare and government uh, work. Uh, the Linux kernel has been rebased to 4.18.0-305. Now, it is the same kernel version as 8.3. I mean, it's 4.18. So the reason for that I've explained before is that Red Hat does... Uh, they backtrack the uh, the releases so that if they need to add new features in, they will back backtrack the latest kernel, some of the latest kernel things, features, or support back into the 4.18. And the reason for that is quite simple. Generally, if you change your major release number, that is, now I'm not talking about 4.0, I'm talking about the 18, that number changes then your compliance is out of spec, and that's generally the case. So the re that is the reason why they do it the way they do it, is to try to maintain your compliance windows so you don't fall completely out of spec. Uh, because again, that would require lengthy amounts of times to recertify your environment. Uh, there is the major release changes to this release, however, are in the hybrid cloud enhancements. So they're adding additional features to support hybrid cloud. That would be a, a hybrid public and a hybrid pri private cloud so that you may have instances of both uh, in your environment. So your private cloud would contain data that you didn't want to expose to a broader audience that was maybe outside your company, uh, whereas the public cloud would, of course, be those functions and features that you want to offer to a broader range of users, which are not directly uh, involved in your company's uh, support. Uh, edge computing enhancements, generally in this category, there has been some enhancements made in order to make deployments and management of edge environments much easier. 
uh, in the past, uh, setting up edge and maintaining edge required additional steps and additional work. So Red Hat is attempting to kind of reduce that workflow. There are also, within the Red Hat Insights program, there are uh, additional enhancements for vulnerability, compliance, resource optimization, and subscription management within the features of 8.4. Uh, if you want specifics on these, I would suggest you go read the, the uh, release notes for 8.4 where they will go into very in-depth details on what exactly they have done. I'm just going to give you highlights here today, not, not necessarily specifics. So hardware architectures that are supported by RHEL are AMD and Intel 64-bit architectures. They do not support 32-bit. Sorry about that. Typically, in enterprise environments, you won't find 32-bit very much anyway. So uh, if, you are looking, if you're looking for 32-bit support, you're probably looking for the wrong release, and maybe you should look at something like Debian if, that, if you need that kind of a long-term support uh, and still have the ability to, uh, to operate on older processors. Uh, ARM 64-bit uh, architectures are, of course, supported and have been in RHEL for quite some time. IBM Power Systems, uh, the Lydial Indian versions of those platforms are supported, and IBM Z 64-bit, which, of course, is their former OS 360, 370, you know, that architecture, MVS, all that stuff that you would see in those uh, in those environments. So, yeah, running Linux on Z, for example. Uh, the minimum requirements for RHEL uh, is a 64-bit x86 or AMD processor. Uh, you'll need 4 gig of memory, according to their recommendations, and I think their main reason for that is because some of the management tools that you may choose to uh, deploy onto the system. But uh, as, as far as the overall footprint of RHEL, it is quite compact, usually about 300 megabytes or so. Uh, in my 350 megabytes, maybe. Uh, so depending upon what services you have running, though, yeah, you may need more. If you want a graphical environment, of course, 4 gig is probably going to be the recommended there. Uh, at 20 gig of unallocated disk space. Now, I've listed the screen resolution. That would only be true if you were installing a GUI. If you were just operating off, of course, a terminal base, then, yeah, 80 characters by 23 would probably be fine um, for most things. If you are are doing, um, you know, if you're monitoring and, and so forth, you probably would want a terminal window with a, uh, with a wider and a longer interval in it, so... Some of the major changes in RHEL 8.4 have to, I'm going to break this up into uh, their compartments. So I'll start with security. So IPsec VPN, that's provided by LibreSwan, uh, and that now supports TCP encapsulation and security levels for IKE, IKE version 2. Uh, and so if you need that, that, that feature is now available in 8.4. Uh, SCAP security guide packages, those are the packages which contain uh, some of the rule set, some of the corrections, and some of the risk uh, mitigations uh, would be inside of those packages. And oh, those have been rebased to 0 0.154. Uh, OSCAP has been rebased to 1.3.4. Uh, yeah, so and basically that's improving memory management, trying to reduce the footprint of SCAP. SCAP, of course, is for security. Uh, it's a security compliance uh, environment for testing whether or not your system is meeting the minimum requirements for, say, HIPAA or the minimum requirements for a STIG or a PCI DSS. There's a number of others as well, like the Australian uh, government one. There's governments for FIPS uh, 400 and 800 and so forth. So. If you need those features, yeah. Uh, they have added RHEL 8 ANSSI BP028, uh, and that would be uh, offering an inter in minimal, intermediary, and enhanced profiles for those. Uh, they have also updated the RHEL 8 STIG profile. Now, that's used by DISA. 
the department. Uh, that is the um, uh, that is a governmental agency that regulates classified environments. So, and, and usually it's associated with the military. So, uh, STIG version one, release one, is the, the current level that is supported in 8.4. Uh, there's also a FAP policy D framework that now provides integrity che uh, checking. You might want to, again, read the release notes on the specific things that you might be interested here to get more in-depth information about what they mean by what kinds of integrity checking does it do. Uh, there's also rel Tang container images, and that provides Tang server decryption capabilities for Clevis clients that run in OpenShift container platform OCP clusters or in a separate virtual machine. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in that kind of support, it is, it is now offered in 8.4. Networking, the uh, network management state is a network API for hosts and fully supported in uh, RHEL 8.4. Multi-protocol label switching, or MPLS, uh, is an in-kernel data forward mechanism to route traffic flow across uh, enterprise networks. If you're in a home environment, you're probably not going to be too interested in MPLS, but uh, if you are in a, a, of course, a corporate environment where you have large enterprises in multiple locations, uh, yeah, you probably might be interested in that. Uh, I, IP Route 2 uh, utility provides three new routing control actions. Uh, Mac push, push ETH, and pop ETH. Uh, again, if you want specifics on those, you might want to read the release notes. I'll put a link in the in the show notes for this today in the description. Support for bare UDP devices is now available with the IP link command. That is a technology preview, meaning that this is not something they would recommend for production use just yet. But it might be something that if you're an early adopter or you need advanced features, you might experiment with it, test it, see if it works okay for your environment, and then maybe place it in some limited production fashion or, or in a, uh, a, an environment that you can easily regress in the event that it might fail. Uh, <clears throat> changes to the kernel, there is a... Uh, kpatch DNF package, uh, and that provides a DNF plugin for subscribing to RHEL uh, systems to the kernel live patch update. So, in other words, you now have the ability to live update uh, RHEL 8.4. There's also a proactive compaction, uh, which regularly initiates memory compaction before a request for an allocation is made. So there's a couple of reasons for that. One is you, you want to reduce the number of calls that you're making to continually allocating chunks of memory. And the second problem that you're really trying to mitigate here is to get rid of all the smaller allocation blocks and get them back into larger blocks so that you don't end up fragmenting memory over time. That's generally the two reasons why you do that. There's, pro there's a sure, there, there's always going to be other reasons you might do it, but those are the two major ones that come to my mind when I think of uh, some reasons for why you would want to do compaction before an allocation. There's also a new implementation of slab memory controllers, uh, and that's for controller groups that have been made available in the RHEL 8.4. Uh, and all that's trying to do is reduce the memory footprint of the kernel. So it's just trying to make it a little bit smaller so it doesn't take up as much memory, gives you, and of course that's giving freeing up additional memory for your applications to use, and that's always a good thing. Uh, operating systems, as I have said before, do no useful work for an organization. They are strictly there to manage devices and resources in the machine. But they, in themselves, add nothing to your uh, services offering. The time namespace feature is now available in RHEL 8.4, and there is support now for the Air Detection and Correction, or EDAC, uh, kernel module, which is supported by uh, Intel 8th and 9th gen uh, processors, uh, core processors, I should say. So if you have later versions of CPUs, and you need EDAC, you will now find support for it in 8.4. High availability, so there is a feature called the Pacemaker agent, Resource Agent, and that maintains state that can detect failures asynchronously in the past. 
uh, if it detected a failure, it had to wait for a, a full monitor cycle uh, after that to in, to initiate uh, in, injecting that particular failure into the pacemaker. To now, the way it works is that if a failure occurs, it injects it immediately. It doesn't wait for the next monitor cycle to occur. So it's just giving you uh, more up-to-date information a little quicker on if there are failures that are detected. So that you, maybe you uh, have fewer application failures that you would not know why. <laughs> um, new features in RHEL 8.4. Anaconda replaces the original boot device NVRAM uh, variable list with some new values. So you may find some incompatibilities between boot parameters that you used in the past uh, with 8.4. And there are suggestions in the release notes of what to do and how to handle those. Uh, graphical installation, uh, installation of KVM virtual machines on IBM Z is now supported. Also, there's uh, warnings for, and this is one of them, uh, deprecated kernel boot arguments. So if you do have any of those, you will see error messages about that uh, when you go to boot the machine. Uh, KVM virtualization is usable in RHEL 8 uh, and on Hyper-V virtual machines. So, and again, that's a technology preview, probably not something that you'd want to throw into production, but it is a place where you can do an early look and see whether or not this particular feature meets your needs. Uh, and whether it works well enough to support a production environment. So you'd probably, if you did use this in production, you'd want to make it limited. Uh, support for Intel Tiger Lake GPUs. Now that would be the Intel UHD and also the new XC graphics uh, chips that are available in the Tiger Lake GPUs. Uh, as far as what op uh, versions, I always put these in here. I'll just leave them up on the screen for a few seconds and you can read through the ones that are of interest to you. Um, yeah, it, you'll find these probably a little bit backdated from some of the stuff I talked about with Silver Blue because Silver Blue is always going to be a little bit newer. Uh, as far as a demo is concerned, um, if you want to, if you're on 8.3 today, the only thing that you would need to do would be to do a DNF update. And that upgrade should take place automatically. So, yeah, it, and if, if I think there are some procedures that you have to do with version 6 or version 7 in order to update from those to make the jump to 8.4 directly. Uh, but yeah, going incremental, it, it's not really any big deal. But we can walk through a, uh, a build out of uh, a RHEL 8.4 today and you can take a look at it with me. Okay, so what I want to do here is, well, we'll go and log in to the system. Now, I have already set up the subscription manager, so I am subscribed to the repos on Red Hat using the free developer license to do that. So let's see. And I should be, yeah, I'm on Red Hat. I'm on the 8.3 at the moment. And we can verify that. Uh, yeah, 8.3 is my current release. So in order for me to, now you can, let's just take a look at a few things to make sure. So right now I am at 418.0-240. And what I said earlier was with 8.4, we'll be going to 305. Sorry about that, I forgot to do the attach. So let's try that again. And we'll do a DNF update. This time we should be fine. Yeah, we're good. All right, now I have not enabled the uh, free ones. So you'll see I've got an upgrade here of 327 packages and install 21 new ones. Now I can go up here and take a look at these. I can see that Python 339 is one of them. And we've got some updates to SSSD. We've got some, yeah, yeah, there's quite a few. So we're going to go ahead and let this go. And I will be back when this is done. This will probably take about mm, five or six minutes or so. But yeah, I'll be back. 
Okay, so we have um, we have it done. It, the update is finished. I have not re rebooted yet, but we can check. Yeah, we're still running the old kernel. This may have updated. Yes, it did. So it, it isn't running it fully yet. So let's do a reboot. Make sure that we are under the right kernel version. And uh, we'll wait for it to come back up. The poor man's method of looking for when the system is up, at least the networking part of it is up. Okay, so we might be able to log in, and we can. Let's clear all this junk out. Let's take a look. And yes, we're on 305. And we can, we don't, of course, have HTOP or any of that, but we can run top. So, yeah, it's about 175 meg in use at the moment. Not a lot of memory, but I don't have a lot running either. This is a default system. So, yeah, not a lot going on here. As far as, you know, going through the different features of this, I probably will add some things to the list um, of things to show you that this will do. But for now, I just wanted to show you how to upgrade. Now, remember, this is only the way, the the recommended way to do an update from 8.3 to 8.4. If you're going coming from an older version, like 7 or 6, the release notes has links to discussions on migrating uh, yeah, up to 8.4. So you might want to look those over, make sure you understand what's going on there before you actually do them. So... Yeah, so that's that's basically what I had today. Um, so where is where are the other two versions like Rocky Linux and and those kinds of things? Um, so just like CentOS, there is going probably going to be a delay in order for those. Uh, distros to reach 8.4 because obviously they're going to have to download the libraries and and do whatever magic they have to do in order to rebrand them. You know, if you remember with CentOS, it usually followed a couple of months later, sometimes a little bit longer. Depends on how much effort it is to move the code. So, but um, yeah, I did check. Of course, Rocky Linux and have 8.4 available for it just yet. So. Anyway, that's all I had for today. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please like and subscribe. Thank you once again to all my patrons. I do appreciate uh, the donations that you guys make to help support the channel. Hope to see you all again real soon. And uh, as always, bye for now.